We have been in the book of Acts uh, this year, so if you have your Bible open to Acts chapter 8. Whenever I do this, I'm always intrigued by how God brings us to what He wants us to look at that particular day. Um, I knew where we were headed for weeks. I knew that this was going to be the Scripture that we would look at today. And to be honest, you know, I'm, I'm always, I was looking towards Resurrection Sunday. I know where we're going to be today, where we're going to, what we're going to talk about next week, and what we're going to talk about the week following that, and the week following that is Resurrection Sunday. Let me just say, if you do not invite people to church for Resurrection Sunday, April 9th, shame on you. There is something that's going on in our country with young people. Um, I, Lynn and I went to see Jesus Revolution this week. How many of y'all have seen the movie? All right. How many of y'all who saw the movie would recommend it? Everybody. Uh, some of y'all have not taken your bride to a movie in a while. I highly recommend it. You can give her all the popcorn she wants. You might have to save up a week or two for the prices that you have to pay for the popcorn. But, but uh, this is the story of Greg Laurie, um, who has been one of my heroes. He's a pastor in California that does evangelism too. He was very close, very close to Billy Graham. And uh, I, I, he's one of my heroes. I've just looked up to him. But uh, 53 years ago, there was a revival that happened at Asbury, and it spread. And one of the places that it spread to was San Francisco. San Francisco needs Jesus too. And it spread all over California. California needs Jesus too. And in Southern California, a hippie who got saved, who used to hijack, not hijack, what do you call it when you're catching a ride? <laughs> he would hitchhike, not hijack them, just hitchhike. <laughs> just so that he could witness to them. they pick him up and he'd give them Jesus along the way. And God did a movement. And uh, by the way, contemporary Christian music that people call contemporary happened 53 years ago out of this movement. Um, and all the people that have been blessed by it. God wants to raise up every generation. Greg Laurie said this. You know, we just had a revival that happened at Asbury again in February. Greg Laurie says that he lived that time in 1970 when the they were called... It was called the Jesus Movement then. Time Magazine called it the Jesus Revolution. We called them Jesus Freaks. He said that he's never known a time that is as, like, as much like that time as it is now. And I think that if you want to just blow off what your pastor has to say, <clears throat> don't get too used to it, but uh, I encourage you to go to the movie. Get a girl, get, get some girls, y'all get some girlfriends up, husbands, take your wives, men, go. Uh, some of y'all lived it. I, when Lynn and I went, I saw a friend of mine there. I was his pastor for 12 years. And uh, when he got saved, he was the hippie with hair down to here. And uh, you'll, you, you'll absolutely have a new understanding about what God might be doing today. What God might be doing today. I said that to say this, I really believe this message that's just the next one in the series, I told Lynn, I said, I really believe God wants to say this. And I don't want you to miss it. And I told her, my fear is that they'll hear a sermon, but not hear the message from God. I don't want to just give you a sermon. We're so sermon deaf. We know how it begins and the Scripture. But, but my prayer is that the Holy Spirit will be able to speak. Some people will be able to be touched by the Word of God that we just sang about. 
Our God is able. And I just need to tell you that my job is to speak the name of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit will take this thing and make it come alive. I really believe there's some people who need to hear this. So if you have your Bible, Acts chapter 8, and in honor of Jesus, would you just stand in reading His Word? <clears throat> I'm going to read a lot of the Scripture, but I just can't get away from the Scripture. Verse 1. Saul was consenting to his death. That's speaking of Stephen's death that we talked about last week. At that time, a great persecution arose among the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. What was seen as a bad thing, persecution, was a very good thing because it got them out of their comfort zone. They left Jerusalem and they're scattered everywhere. But, but just like uh, uh, the guy that was hitchhiking, to take the gospel, they were leaving so that the gospel could go to places it would not have gone otherwise. Verse 3, As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house, dragging men off, men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip, now in chapter 6 when we talked about deacons, the first one we talked about was Stephen. He got stoned last week. All right. The second one we talked about was Philip. This is his story. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. The multitudes with one accord, he did the things spoken by Philip, hearing the th and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of the many who were possessed. And many who were paralyzed and uh, who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. But there was a certain man that called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. And indeed heeded him because he was astonishing them with his sorceries for a long time. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God, in the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and the signs which were done. We're going to look at more scripture than that, but let me just pray over this right now. Now, my Lord, my Savior, my God, we're gathered in this place because of you. You're the Lord of the universe, and for many of us, you're the Lord of our life. You're the God of all power. You can do all things. And Lord, we're needy people. And we truly need a work that you can do in our life. We've done enough. And Lord, I believe there's good people who want to do right things. But Lord, there may be some things that you need to put your finger on in the life where you want to do a work in their life. You want to set them free. You want to heal them to the uttermost. And Lord, I pray that today that which is hidden will be revealed. I pray that, which, that work that you want to do, that you will speak it into the lives of the individuals. In Jesus, we will give you honor and praise for what you and only you can do. In your name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Philip finds himself going down to a city called Samaria. A place that the Jews looked down on those people. Matter of fact, they called the people of Samaria dogs. The Jews just didn't like them. But as you know, John chapter 4, Jesus went through Samaria on purpose, met a woman there who her life was just absolutely upside down. She had husbands living with someone else. Her life was empty. Her life was broken. She didn't feel like she could go and get water at a time when other people would go and get water in the morning. She waited till the middle of the afternoon to do that because she didn't want to be seen by others. 
But Christ found himself there. He sent the disciples into the city to get food. He needed one-on-one time. I want you to know God knows who you are, where you are, where you're hurting, and God wants to meet you there. Because if God meets you there, healing can happen in your life. Now, Philip is doing simply what he was called to do, preach the gospel. He's not there to debate religion with them. God help us. Right? We're, we're not in this win-lose. Or, Listen to me, I have all the answers. No. What our responsibility is just to love people in Jesus' name and speak the name of Jesus to them. Just give them Jesus. Just let them know what Christ has done for you. If you can do that, then the Holy Spirit may put an itch in them and they may say, you know, I really would like this for Christ to do something in my life as well. Well, that's what Philip was doing. And and people were being saved. And the manifestation of God, listen, don't chase miracles. Don't chase signs. We all want to be amazed. What we need to be amazed in is Christ. Because really the miracles, what the miracles were, was Christ meeting needs in people's lives, and there was no need that he could not meet, was not willing to satisfy just to let everyone know that he was sent from God to give the blessings of God to the people of God who were in need. And when people started to believe, people started to be healed. Everyone was astonished by it. And even this man by the name of Simon, Simon was unique here. We find that he uh, it says here in verse 9 that he previously practiced sorcery, darkness, the power of darkness. The Bible teaches us that God had certain creations that we know as angels. Angels, archangels, seraphim, cherubim. Now, the Bible also tells us that sometimes we'll meet angels unaware. I've never had anybody come up to me and say, Hi, Brian, I'm an angel from God. I had not have that. But evidently, those in the Old Testament, we see those that were there. In the New Testament, we see the manifestations there. God's the same God all the time. But it's not, we don't need a name tag to look at them. Really, in everyone's life, we just judge by what we see. Correct? But here's the thing that we find out. That Lucifer wanted to be like God. He wanted to be a God. He liked how everybody gave praise, glory, honor to our Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, and He wanted the power of the Holy Spirit. He was full of wisdom and beauty, is what it says. And one-third of the angels agreed with Lucifer. They wanted that same thing for themselves, but they didn't realize and didn't know that if they wanted it for themselves, then that's all that they had. And I tell you, anybody, it doesn't matter how gifted you are, how great God made you, how smart, all of those things, how beautiful you are, none of those things matter. If you do not have God, you have nothing. Nothing. That's what's going to make hell bad. It's not just the fire and the brimstone. It's just a way of describing something that we can't describe with words. But what will make hell, hell is the absence of love, the absence of peace, the absence of God. God can't deny His nature. But God can take away His nature from those who do not want it. And hell will be people who will spend eternity without the blessings of the goodness of God. And the the gift of God is God wants us to have those things so that we who were created for such could understand fulfillment. But a lot of people search for fulfillment. Those angels did. And then when they found that they could not have the nature of God, the ugliness on the other side came out. We call them demons today. And this is the thing that I don't fully understand. They made that choice. And they live with the consequences of that choice. But like any person that has been hurt by their choices, it's not just enough that others can have goodness. They want to attack 
those people. I don't know what it is about human nature. If, if we see someone and, and, and they seem like a, 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 an enemy to us, we want to tear them down to our level. We'll gossip about them. We'll lie about them. We'll, we'll shun them. We'll withhold our love from them. Understand that all of these things are these angels that now find themselves against God. They use the powers that God has allowed them to have, and, and they use them to come against other people. They're in chains, and they want other people bound in darkness as well. And in this particular case, this person by the name of Simon gave himself over to darkness and this power of darkness was producing sorcery. Be very careful of what you open yourself up to. Be very careful of what you let into your life. Be very careful of the quicksand. You may be passing through life and then you just don't understand, but you get yourself into something that will make you sink. And it will grab a hold of you. And the more you try to get out of it in your strength, the more that you will find that you're stuck in it. Isn't it funny? I, I saw the Jesus Revolution movie, and uh, how many of y'all know the hippies smoked something called pot? and took drugs, and drank a beer. You know, marijuana, in the 500 names that it's called, is called a gateway drug. I, I help people in addiction since 1994. I was actually a, the, the director of, of a 12-step, six-month program. I've always had a heart for those people in addiction. And, and, and the goal is to help them find that they can't get out on their own, but Christ can set them free. But don't ever look over the fact that when someone will say, hey, take this, you can have it free. There's something behind that. I've never met a person who drank a beer and said, that's the most fantastic thing I've ever had. It's an acquired taste. And I see people, they'll go get a, a 12-pack or two 12-packs, and you know it'll be gone in a day or two because they just drink and drink and drink. It never started that way. The first person that took that drink of scotch, they didn't become an alcoholic like that. They grew to it. Pot, it's an introductory drug. Astrology. Oh, I, I, you, do y'all remember that when we used to get newspapers? And there were people who would fly to the back real quick because they wanted to read their horoscope. Oh, I don't put any stock in that whatsoever. And I'm like, well, what are you doing? Be very careful what you let into your life. I knew when the lottery came to this state, I knew that, and y'all remember when everybody was against everything? Disney, we're going to ban Disney. We're going we're to ban Levi's. We're going to ban Starbucks. We're going to ban the lottery. Look, I, I like coffee. How many of y'all knew that? You just come around me, you'll smell my breath, right? People say, Pastor, you're, you're strong. And I say, the only thing strong in me is my breath. It smells like Sumatra, you know. Be careful what you let in and be careful what you, you don't know. I, what I was worried about the lottery was because it, it, it's never going to stay there. There's something where someone feels incomplete. What could I do if I had all this money? I had a preacher tell me one time, says, I don't play the lottery unless it gets over 100 million. <laughs> Where are we going with all this stuff? Look, let me just say this. Are there things that people get into and they, 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 that will take them further down a road than they ever thought they would go? Harder to ever come back from. It really doesn't matter if it's gossip. Lying. It really doesn't matter what it is. Coveting. Envy. Fame. It really doesn't matter what it is. A desperate desire to be liked and become codependent. 
Be very careful what you let into your life because it may take root. Well, that's what happened in Simon's life. He liked it because of the pride. He had an ego. He liked that people said, oh, this is a great person. And, and, and really, look at this. This is what they said about Simon at the end of verse 10. This man is the great power of God. He liked that. But then he sees Philip, and, and Philip's preaching, and people are getting saved, and, and he feels the same compulsion within How many of you know that God will call you to himself no matter where you've been? No matter what you've done, that the love of God is greater. The blood of Christ can cleanse you. Praise God for that. Nobody is too far gone. Praise God for the wooing of the Holy Spirit. Well, this is starting to happen in Samaria. There's a revival. There's an awakening happening in Samaria. They hear about it. In Jerusalem, so they send old Peter and John, they say, go down there and straighten them out. Make sure that they're doing the right thing. They found that there were some there that that had heard, listen, and had been baptized because they said that they believed in Jesus, but they never were really converted. I'm going to highlight this for just a moment because I talk to so many people. And I say, do you know Christ? Well, yes. And then I said, well, tell me about it. They can't. But really, what, you're asking, what they're asking is, do you believe in Christ? And they said, well, of course I believe in Christ. And they think that that makes them a Christian. Listen. They think that that will make sure that they never go to a place called hell, that they can live their life the way that they want to, and God will take them to heaven, and they'll have joy forevermore. And they'll say, because I believe. Let me give you a word. Uh, James chapter 2, verse 9. The Bible says, you believe there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. It takes more than that. So Peter and John started to share what they needed to do to become Christians. And many people became Christians and they received the Holy Spirit of God in their life. Now, when... When when Simon saw that that Peter and John could pray and and touch them and the Holy Spirit could come upon them, look, it wasn't the power in Peter and and John. It wasn't just the laying on of hands. The laying on of hands is simply symbolic for the blessing of God. But when he saw that, he said, you can do that. They received the Holy Spirit. He said, can I have that? I would be willing to pay you. Look what it says in verse 19. Give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter said to him, your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter for your heart is not right in the sight of God, then he gives them what he needs to do. He doesn't just leave him out there lost. He says, repent, therefore. Repent means to change your mind. Repent means I turn from what I think and I take the thoughts of God and and not only do I believe in him, but I accept them for myself. Repent, therefore, of your wickedness. Pray, God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. Repentance means I'm doing things wrong and I need to turn from that. It really means an about face. If you're heading this direction, you make an about face. I don't want that anymore. I look at that that I was doing before and, and I change from that. I repent of that. I don't want that. But notice the next verse. Peter, when he looked at Simon, he said, for I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Poisoned by bitterness. Simon, what I understand is that you've let some things into your life that you need to get rid of. Wounds. Can we take a poll? How many of y'all have ever been hurt? It's 
Sticks and stones may break your your bones, (laughs) but names will never hurt you. Y'all ever heard that? That's a lie. How many of y'all ever been picked on? How many of you have ever had names? And the whole point of that is somebody trying to tear you down. How many of you ever met the bully in the playground? How many of you know that those bullies grow up? They want their way. And not only do they want their way, they want you to know that they're in charge, that they're better. I met a person in addiction. Love him to death. Love him to death. In the third grade, his teacher said, you're nothing but poor white trash. You're nothing now and you never will be. He got into that gateway drug, which led into other things. His parents kicked him out of the house at 16. He lived on his own, selling drugs, drove a nice car. There's money in sin. Found himself in rehab. By the way, talented it. Oh, he was the Pied Piper. I mean, people would just follow him. So smart. So smart. But you know what? It, it wasn't just all about drugs. He had to heal from a wound from a third grade teacher. Says, you're not nothing. You'll never be nothing. You're just poor white trash. Because that became his identity. God doesn't make trash. God would not leave heaven and go to the cross of Calvary for trash. You're a jewel. That's really the term. You're a precious jewel in the eyes of God. I don't really know of anyone who knows the full value that they have to God. Every one of us do not look at ourselves the way God looks at us. I love my wife. Y'all know I love my wife. She is a precious gift of God for me. But even how much I love her and cherish her and seek to put her up on a pedestal because that's where she deserves to be, still God sees more value in her than I do. And I don't think there's anybody in all the world that loves her as much as I do. Here's the thing. Those wounds that happen in our life, if we let them go, they will become strongholds. Something, somebody will say something, somebody will do something, and there's a wound that's there. And how, how many of you know that around that wound, a scab will grow? But it doesn't just happen once. Others will come against it too. So we'll we'll, we'll have this sore spot in our life and others will come and it will rip that scab off again and the pain will be there again, again and again and again and again. And every time another scab will grow, but then a little poison will be inside it. It's almost as if somebody shot you with a poison bullet and it's lodged within you, but the doctor never took it out. And it's just there and around it, an abscess has grown. And life just continues to happen and the effects of it continue to hit us. What most of us don't know is that we're wounded as children and we live with the consequences of it the remainder of our life. And that's not what God wants for us. Ignoring it 
will do no good. If you ignore it, you will face the consequences of more of the poison that is there. You have been poisoned by bitterness, bound by iniquity. Hebrews chapter 12 speaks of a person who's been beat up. So in Hebrews 12, verse 12, the Bible says this, Therefore strengthen the hands which hang down, and the feeble knees make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may, be, may, not, may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all people. Holiness, the things of God, without which no one can see the Lord. Now listen to verse 15. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. <clears throat> Let me give you a, a quick Explanation of this for my life. Um, I'd gone through some things. Uh, we all go through things. Y'all might not realize it, realize it, but I'd have never, I was not always as perfect as I am now. <laughs> and um, what I didn't realize is to the extent of it, it was in my life. At 21, I had my epiphany. Got saved at 10. I, at 21, I turned around. At 24, I, I was a financial planner. I had my life planned. I was moving in that direction. Everything was good. I was the golden boy. Everything I touched turned to gold. Everything was great. But, but God hijacked me. He did hijack me. And, and, and I did. I, I had to release it, and I surrendered to the ministry. Um, then I was going to conference and I was at Roswell Street Baptist Church in, in Marietta, and I was sitting in the upper deck of a conference, and it was like this spotlight hit on me. The, the man was preaching, Tom Elliff. He was pastor at that point in time of uh, First Southern Baptist Church of Dell City, Oklahoma, just outside of Oklahoma City. And Tom Elliff was preaching on forgiveness. And what I did not realize, I had already accepted the call to preach. I, I was full bore for God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. But what I did not realize is when I was sitting there, I was bitter in unforgiveness. Now, if you want to hear my story, I'll tell it to you sometime. But listen, it really doesn't matter what my story was. I had been hurt by it. There was a wound that was there. And, and what I would do is I would say, it was their fault. And by the way, I had some blame in that. But it should have never happened. I was the victim. And the problem with that was I blamed them for everything. That doesn't work. And, and I felt justified in how I viewed that person because they should not have done that. And I was hurt by it. And if you had said that person's name, my blood pressure would have went from here to hear in 0.2 seconds without me even knowing it. And God's light hit me that day and it began to take that scab off in my life and it healed that poison that was within me. Now I will tell you, it wasn't a magic pill. It wasn't a magic moment. I had to live it out and I'm still living it out. It wasn't like I was just freed. I was freed, but I had to get up and learn the effects of that. So what it was like was God took layer after layer after layer, and he cleaned up that poison. If that person walked in the door right there, I would welcome them to the front seat. I could give them a hug in Jesus' name. And there's nothing in my life that would feel anything but the grace of God for them. But before it, I didn't realize I was coming short of the grace of God. The grace is God's best. 
And we all should want God's best for everyone. But this quicksand that can become a root of bitterness. You don't see the root, but you see the fruit of it. And when God began to do that work, it began to change every relationship I had in my life. Here's the thing. If God put His finger on an area of your life and He says, I want to do a blessed, glorious, wonderful thing, would we say, Lord, I'm all for you doing a blessed, glorious thing. Bless me here, bless me there. I've been praying for you to, to bless this and bless that. He said, no, 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 no. I want to start there. We like, But Lord, not there. You know that's hard for me. Let's not talk about that, Lord. He said, I don't want to talk about anything else. Lord, can't we just start slow in another area? I'll give more. I'll witness more. I'll do this. I'll do that. I'll do this. He's like, no, 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 no. This is where I want to begin because what you don't realize is that is created a, a wound within inside you and there's pus and there's poison and, and I want total, complete health for you. You're bound by this iniquity in your life. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is, do you know the word? Liberty. Freedom. I would not go back to unforgiveness if you paid me. As a matter of fact, the place in my life where I was the weakest has now become my strength. I was meeting with Jojo Thomas, our, uh, our area missionary, and he knows something that happened in my life in another church and lies that were shared about me, and, and, and he knows that I didn't try to defend myself. If somebody wanted to come and ask me the truth, I'd tell them the truth. But I wasn't going around saying, they're wrong, they're wrong. I just left it in the Lord's hands. And Brother Jojo said, when I talked with you about that, here was the amazing thing in your life, Brian. You didn't care. You were freed up. You weren't bitter. You weren't hard. I'm like, no, no, no. What I have learned is that when someone comes against me, my responsibility as a Christian is to pray for them. Not just pray, Lord, strike them dead. No, 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 no. That's an easy prayer to pray. Pray blessings on them. Pray God will put His hand of anointing on them. Pray the, the, the unsearchable riches of the peace and the love of God will go to that person who makes me their enemy. Because I have been freed up for, with unforgiveness years ago, God has allowed my life to become about pouring blessings on people that could not have happened otherwise. It doesn't matter what somebody else did. My dad was one of 10 kids, and he felt neglected. How could you not feel neglected if there's got nine brothers and sisters? And every one of those brothers and sisters had nine brothers and sisters. That was a big home. Understand this. God knew it. God allowed it. And either we can let it become a strength in our life, or it will continue to be poison in our life. But when the Holy Spirit puts His finger there, He means it for good. So look real quickly. Some things you need to do. Number one, allow the Holy Spirit to bring the light against that root of bitterness in your life. You don't have to hunt it. God will put His finger on it. Just be open to it. We've lived in was for so long, we're, we've, we're accustomed to having it in part of our life. But God wants to call it something else. You may call it one thing. I, I knew a woman one time, and she said, she, she said, uh, uh, I, I am justified in my anger. I'm like, you're an idiot. The only person you're hurting yourself. Righteous indignation. 
I have a righteous indignation. No, you're just bitter. Number two, allow the Holy Spirit to put His finger on it. Begin the journey. It's a journey to health. It's a journey to health. It may take a while. It may take a lifetime. But please hear your pastor's words. You'll never, you'll never, you will never, ever, ever regret it. Begin the journey. Let him come over you. Let him pull it over. Let him put the, the penicillin of the Holy Spirit against that poison that's in your life. God can do instant miracles. But most of the time, he allows the, the growth to happen slowly. See, what I, when I had unforgiveness, I really put that person's name on it. But what I found out was I was unforgiving against that person and that person and that person and that person. That poison was just everywhere. And I had to begin forgiving people one person at a time. Temptation is the same way as persecution. It's a blessing and a gift of God that can lead you to great places, but most of us don't want to go there. Allow the Holy Spirit to touch it. Begin the journey. Give it to Jesus. You're not going to like this third one. Allow other people to know your life to speak life into you. What Jerry just talked about up here, most of us don't do. Most of us have a small group of people that we can talk to, but there are certain areas in our life we don't talk to anybody about it. As if you could heal it. But here's the thing. God may bring somebody else into it. One of my testimonies about a small group, I say, you come. And they'll say, well, and, and by the way, when I do my small group, we'll go around the room and we'll get, we meet once every two weeks and I call it catching up. What's been going on in your life? What's been, what have you been facing? And, and that's what I can do. That's what I do with them. I hold them accountable. And they'll all say this. Oh, I'm good. Been a good week. How's work? Oh, it's just work. And I just know that there's something else that's underlining there. So one of us will ask a question. One week, Jared did that. One week, Jared was up there and he's like, oh, I'm good. It's this, it's this. Another person in the group said, hey, two weeks ago you were mentioning this. What about that? He said, well, we're all good, but it's good to have somebody that you will allow to speak life within you because oftentimes what you're facing, they've already faced. And you may go to, to be with a group of people and you're saying, well, I'm not going to get anything out of it. Well, one week you may not get much out of it, but you might be the blessing for someone else. And it needs to be Christian-based. We all go find a book at the bookstore to think about it. We'll Google it and we'll find out what we can do about it. Or, or we'll ask somebody else and we'll say, what do you think about it? But really what we're wanting is for them to agree with us. This is the Word of God for you, the people of God. Praise be to God. It's not everything God knows, but it's got every answer that we need. There's a dual blessing. Letting them come into your life. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful among all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? You can't see yourself. You, you don't know yourself. Let God. Don't run from the pain. And don't procrastinate repentance and giving it to God. Begin the journey and allow weaknesses to become strengths. I wonder how many of you are willing for God to open you up. He may need to do some surgery. There may be a wound that's been in your life for a long time. Are you willing? Are you willing? You can ignore it. Some of us have been ignoring it for quite some time. Nobody likes to go under the knife, especially us men. 
but there's healing there. Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. Are y'all just good with just life when God wants you to have abundant life? If you've got a sore spot, and you know what that is, that's a good place to start. Listen to the Holy Spirit of God. Don't be proud. When I got saved, I had to get rid of my pride and give my life to Christ. But what I found out was when I give my life to Him, He gives His life for me.